Do you remember when you first, uh, when you were first drawn to myths, and before even before you started studying them and made them your subjects? Well, it started when I was a very young man. I was always attracted, I have to say, uh, first of all to the Greek stories, then very early to to the Indian ones. What I started reading is well, the obvious things one starts with, that's to say the main Upanishads, mm. Bhagavad Gita, and from that, from there on, from that on, I started reading scholars. Where were you, where were you first exposed to myths? Do you remember the, the first? In the books. In the first couple of Yeah, well. Um, you've been studying myths for a really long time. You've been reading them for a really long time. How has your process of uh, approaching them and maybe what you go in looking for evolved or changed over the years? Well, you know, I realized that myths are a special way of knowledge which cannot be substituted with other things. You can ignore it or if you follow it, it goes very far. And it goes very far in the direction of knowledge as in a way as science or philosophy. It is, knowledge is made with, not only with concepts, not only with uh, experiments, it's made with stories, can be made of stories. And that was what, that is what I followed. And of course, at a certain moment, I started doing something which, in fact, has always been done in literature, so retelling. In fact, literature is, from the beginning, a retelling. Homer is retelling stories which were well known around him, and even Shakespeare is retelling stories. He has not invented a single story himself. He always took the material somewhere in whatever he, he could find, chronicles, uh, stories, novellas, and so on. And so I started writing The uh, Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony. That was in the 80s. And that is my first book, which is specially connected with myths. You used the term uh, mythography for uh, Marriage of uh, Harmony yeah. and Cadmus. Would you explain that term a little bit? Well, mythography is a very ancient word uh, which describes exactly what uh, certain writers are doing and uh, which is retelling myths, for instance. Uh, and that can be done in totally different ways. I don't know, Apollodorus is a mythographer, but he writes very, uh, very spare chronicles of facts. And a mythographer, in a way, is of it and uh, he's a great poet and he, he wrote a huge uh, marvelous poem uh, which includes in itself lots of stories. So it's a very ancient job and uh, it has gone on even beyond the, the classical world. You know, a great Italian writer, uh, uh, storyteller, Boccaccio, wrote uh, in Latin a, a, a book which is called the genealogy, the genealogy of the Pagan Gods. And that is another way of making, uh, telling stories and making mythography. One of, the, yeah. one of the things that you keep, you, you keep saying is that myths are a way of, in a, in a sense, a marriage of philosophy and poetry. They're a way of accessing um, a knowledge. Yeah. That, that you know of truth and reality, which is not accessible by other means. Um, would you illustrate that for me? Would you give me a couple of examples from any of the myths where uh, this is where this comes across most vividly? Well, practically everywhere. If you let's take uh, an Indian example. The story of Prajapati, Rudra, Ushas, and uh, the gods, which is one of the most important myths in the Brahmanas. That is something which gives you the feeling of how the world is based on 
Well, first of all, on guilt. And second point on an act, a violent act happening. And this guilt is on one side, the guilt of the God himself who creates the world. That is for the reason why Prajapati is punished by his own sons, who are the gods. Uh, that is like a wound in something which is a wound in fullness. So Prajapati uh, accepts to be dismembered in the world. And that is, and that is a big wound which can be healed only, the Brahmanas say, the Brahmanas say, through the ritual. And uh, that is a kind of knowledge you get only through this story. Uh, otherwise, the ritual wouldn't have any meaning. And uh, so that's an example, but uh, you can have many others. You know, in one sense, uh, myth, myths are a collective conscience of, of uh, society. In, you've studied both ancient Greek and ancient Hindu myths. In what ways would you say the societies were distinct from one another, and what ways were they similar? Well, it's a long story. <laughs> they were totally different. Uh, the, um, first of all, you know, uh, in Greece, there was a phenomenon that you find very early, which is the polis. Polis is the city. The city, uh, which is the center, religious, political, cultural, everything. And that is what the Western world has inherited. In the Vedic world, in the, and I mean the world which goes down to the Upanishad, not, not afterwards, there's not even a word for city. There are no cities. No, uh, it's, it's, they are semi-nomadic people who will go from one place to another. They don't have temples. They don't have statues. They have only words. No things. I mean, if you go to, if you want to have a access to the Vedic world, you have to read. Otherwise, you have nothing. You go to the museums, and the, there are no artifacts. Very poor, very simple artifacts, but uh, practically nothing else. In Greece, you have very early um, statues, vases, temples, and so on. So you see, there are two different ways. And in the same way, would you say about the idea of morality and politics in, is, is distinct? Well, of, of course, uh, totally different. You know, uh, it, uh, they develop different ideas. In in uh, for for. Uh, in the Vedic world, what is essential is this duality of Brahmans and Kshatriyas, uh, who are at the same time allies and enemies. I mean, there is a tension, and at the same time, they can work together. You know, that there is a uh, that is. The, the Vedic theory of power, that it should have two heads. One is Brahmans and the other is Kshatriyas. In, in Greece, you have a totally different collection, totally, well, a different conception with some elements in common. And the best you can do is to read the Republic of Plato. And there you find the most articulated theory. That, and that is. Is there? A, would you say there is a lot lost, lo lost in translation, in the way uh, myths translate into religion rituals, the way they are practiced in India, and of course politics, which has you know it's possibly the only country which still bases a large part of its right-wing politics on the interpretation of. Uh, I think there, there are large, large areas of big misunderstandings, and first of all. Hinduism, from Vedic India to Hindu India, there is a passage which is very mysterious and which has still to be explored. And that happens in the dividing line is 
one could say the fifth century before, uh, before BC. And what happens afterwards is a huge uh, story with invasions, with the Muslim uh, coming. And so what is Hinduism today would be very difficult to say. And what I'm sad of is to see that very often there are people pretending to have such a contact with ancient rituals, practices, thoughts, but no corresponding knowledge of the texts and so on. So it's more a sort of uh, pretension. Have you faced any opposition from the right wing, either in Italy or in India, for your writing? Well, uh, I'm glad to say that in India, up to now, uh, and I had many public occasions in various, in various places, in Calcutta, in now in Chennai, last year in Cochin or in Delhi, to have discussions with people. I had a very good impression of the audiences. They were very, very lively. They made very precise remarks, as you have seen here. And I don't remember really uh, uh, unpleasant occasion up to now it can happen next you've, moment you but. you've added a flair to your even in car there's a there's your own distinctive voice that you add to when you retell myths well and that is that, that is a task of the writer which is which perpetrates the thing that the myth is a living thing so yeah, you know that is a task of the writer to have a voice and, and, and have you been, has there been academic opposition to this basic idea that the myths are living and they must be added to, not just interpreted and reinterpreted, but also added to? Is that, is that something, because you're not maybe an Indian, is that something that, that has also... No, I was, I, I was telling you, I, it never happened up to now, it can happen any minute, sure. that I found a sort of uh, unpleasant reaction. And... Uh, uh, but I know that in India there are very, very, very harsh conflicts yes. on these things. And uh, I think what India would need first is a better, more closer knowledge of itself, of its past, of its real past. I gave the example of the Brahmanas. They are almost invisible in bookshops, you never find them. But some of them have been, in fact, translated, published with commentaries and so on. So if one wants, through Amazon, through AB Books, at a very low price, one could buy these books, learn from them. But I don't find that so often. And, and uh, uh, that is sad, that is sad, because I think you cannot you know, the word Vedic, when, when I find people that, who react very badly to the word, or too enthusiastically to the word Vedic, without having a precise sense of what it means, what it refers to. I think the best would be to start with the texts, because there's nothing else. You cannot go, if you go to a museum, you, you won't find anything really useful from that age. But, uh, so, that is one point. Yes, you've been a publisher for a really long time. You said once that you, you know, you uh, support good books with good books. Uh, it's, is, has the recession, has the technology in, in, impacted the way publishing industry is you changing? Know, you know, uh, publishing is a very strange job and from the economical point of view is so unimportant that it's the last thing which is uh, uh, influenced by, by, by or, or, yeah. So, for instance, uh, after the uh, general crisis, economic crisis, we had two rather brilliant years. So I cannot complain now. It may come that at a certain moment things get worse, but up to now I cannot complain at all, <laughs> at all. And, uh, and, and you know, would you say the same thing about technology, the coming in of different ways of reading books? And well, that we have to see now. We cannot judge. In fact, uh, this year will be very important because, first of all, they have to, they are producing hardware in a different way. Uh, and uh, it may be that there will be a sort of explosion of ebooks. Uh, but up to now, 
you know, things change every two or three months. So it's obvious that many things will, will be used in that way, but how and in which amount, that is difficult to say. I think it's, we can't, simply. My All predictions were wrong up to now, in any case. <laughs> Yeah. My final question to you would be about you're an avid, avid book collector, I believe. I, well, I buy books all, in all directions and in fact I even like buying first editions or, or rather. Tell me about one or two in, in this year or in the last couple of months, something very exciting that you might have chanced upon them or, you know, there's always a story to collect. Book collectors always have, are full of stories about books yeah. and how they find in them, this, how they chase them. Yeah. And, uh, well. You know, in these last two or three months, not much, I would say, but... Uh, what Your is? last memory, any, any... Well, sometimes I happen to get hold, of, even in, in, uh, in the direction of Indology, where I collect many things. Sometimes I really echo something which was I was looking for years, years and finally found was uh, a book which is legendary for Indology, and that is the first translation of the Upanishad done by Anquetil du Perron. And that is a marvelous story because it is a translation not from Sanskrit but from Persian. It is a translation from a translation in Persian translated into Latin from this, by this Frenchman, beginning of the 19th century. And that is a book that when Schopenhauer could read, he said he wrote, our century has a great advantage in knowledge in relation to all other centuries because we have this book. And I look, it's very rare. And I looked for it for years, and then recently I, I found a copy. So that Where is. Where did you find it? Well, it was a German. It was a German antiquarian bookseller. You know, lots of things now we get by AB Books through. So, so sometimes I order books from New Zealand, and uh, uh, from the most remote places, and. Uh, so that is a sort of compulsion which goes on. <laughs> That'll be all. Thank you.